Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, Guy Stacy with me. Hello everyone. In today's class, we're going to be talking about the New Covenant. We're going to be talking about the Day of the Lord and its relationship to this New Covenant. Um, we'll be talking about the Great Awakening, which is pretty much the same thing. You hear us use these words interchangeably in a lot of our classes. Day of the Lord, Great Awakening, and even the Rapture sometime, which we understand to be... Um, where our spirits is exalted to a uh, higher level of understanding. So you, you hear us use these words interchangeably. But today I brought Stacy in to help me talk about the new covenant because Stacy has done plenty of classes on the new covenant and done plenty of study on the new covenant. Ain't that right, Stay? And I think I said covenant when I should have said conscious. You've done classes on the conscious that we're looking at on the screen. Is that right? Yes, I have um, studied um, the Third Testament, chapter 17, quite a bit, and um, just some other scriptures from the uh, KJV and other books. Chapter 17? Uh, chapter 34, I'm I sorry. was going to say, yeah, your class came out of, uh, uh, you did a series um, from chapter 34, mm -hmm. uh, which was on the free will and the conscious. And um, so you got a lot of knowledge on the conscious. Some knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the last class we did was the relationship between the new covenant and the conscious. You remember that class? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to talk more about the new covenant. There's a lot of people who are asking questions uh, when it comes to the new covenant, they're asking, what is it? What is uh, the Messiah's role in the new covenant? And so we decided to go ahead and do an entire class uh, around that. Um, uh, before we get started, I want to let you guys uh, know we're going to be making mistakes and errors in the way that we're recording this video. We won't have uh, the chance to edit it that much. So please bear with us as we trip over our words and mispronounce stuff and stutter while we're reading and all of that. Yeah, we're always having, you know, a few problems with um, solar and things of that nature. So, you know, I think they understand now. Yeah, we just got rid of uh, Hurricane Sally and now here come Hurricane Beta. They didn't got rid of, they, they didn't <laughs> ran out of names now using the alphabet. All right, so let's jump right into it. Now, the primary focus of this class is going to come out of Hebrews chapter 8, but we're going to be jumping all over the scripture as we normally do here. But what verse do you think we ought to start with in chapter 8? Let's start on verse 7. Verse 7. Let me go ahead and read it. It says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You, you 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 understand the two different covenants, right? Yeah, two. And let's talk about what the word covenant means again. We know that the word covenant just simply means agreement. Right. right. It's actually the contract that we're under right. that was made back there at uh, Mount Horeb. Um, when the scripture refers to the law and says we're supposed to be obeying the law, it's not talking about all 613 different rules, statutes, ordinances, precepts, and good ideas that you find in the first five books of the Bible. When the Bible refers to the word law, it's talking about the covenant, which starts in Exodus chapter 20 and goes uh, all the way through through chapter 23. It all ends at verse 7 of chapter 24 when all two million of those people said and agreed that all that the Lord has said will we um, uh, or be obedient to or something like that. Um, that's the book of the covenant. That is actually the contract that we're un under. So when you hear some people say, you know, they are covenant keepers, that's what they're referring to. Mm hmm. All right. So it's talking about two separate covenants. It's saying the first covenant, that covenant that was given back there in Mount Horeb, it said if uh, that covenant had been faultless, then should be no place uh, for the second covenant. Right. Yeah. Well, you understand what it means there? It's saying that if uh, if everything would have, uh, if there had not been, I don't want to say mistakes, but it's saying that that covenant wasn't perfect. Yeah, it wasn't perfect. Well, to understand what it was, wasn't was perfect about that covenant was that it was written on stone tablets. Mm -hmm. And you remember 
the first thing that Moses did with those stone tablets when he came off the mountain was threw them down and broke them. Yes. Yep. So he broke the covenant first thing and he had to go back up the mountain. And people leave out that part, how he went back up the mountain and stayed up there for another 40 days and got those same laws written again on stone tablets. You know, I guess he, you know, wouldn't have broke them again because he get tired of sitting on that mountain for so long. And those tablets ended up in the Ark of the Covenant that they walked around with. But the thing about it, the, we're going to find out in this class the what the new covenant and the differences between the new covenant. There are some differences in the new covenant, but there are some similarities in the new covenant. We're going to find out too. Those are important too. Yes. All right. Verse eight says for finding fault with them. He saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Okay, so when it says the days come, what is he talking about? Is he talking about now or? Yeah, you have to remember that we first heard about this covenant way back there in Jeremiah chapter 31. I think it was verse 31 in the book of Jeremiah was when you first start hearing about this covenant. And these almost exact words are used back there when he's talking about after those days or when those days come. And anytime you see a phrase like that, when it says after those days, he's talking about the end times, if not the tribulation. He's talking about the very end um, when, you know, humanity is about to change. We're, we're in the seven, seventh day now. If you remember a class we did about the seven days of humanity, where humanity is basically given uh, 7,000 years here on this planet before it all burned up. Well, we're just now starting that seventh day. And so this is the end of um, our father's prophetic plan for humanity to 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 grow so to speak so it's more of a future day yeah well i don't know if it, it was future to jeremiah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and it was even future to the author of the book of hebrews right. but here we are in the year 2020 right and you know um uh, I plan. I got it in my notes to show you how Daniel um, was pointing to this day back there in his book, chapter 12. But I think I'll save that for then. But what we're talking about here is how in these times he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in because a lot of people believe we're in this new covenant now. Haven't you heard that before? Yeah, I have. I've heard that when we attended church, I often heard that, yes. Yeah, that's part of church doctrine. Um, you'll hear many uh, 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 teachers talk about how we're actually in this new covenant. But, you know, we're going to show you here how that's actually not true. Let me, let me read verse 9. It says, um, or do you want to read it? I'll read it. 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, said the Lord. Again, what we're talking about is the contract that was made. You know, I, I repeat this often in my videos because, you know, uh, I want people to remember to actually go pick up the the the. Uh, book of Exodus and actually read that covenant, that contract for themselves. It starts in Exodus chapter 20 through uh, 23 or through 24 verse 7. But what you'll see in there, if you go back and read like chapter 19, chapter 18, you'll see that this is when they were actually coming out of uh, Egypt. This is one of the first things that our father did to him, probably right after he gave him something to eat and something to drink, was he gave him this covenant to live by. Yeah, it starts in chapter 19, where he tells them um, that they are to obey his voice and to keep his covenant. Yes. Yeah. And so that's what he's talking about when he said, led them out of Egypt. But he says, because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. See, this, this, the, there's a lot of promises associated with this covenant. Covenant, but the one thing that the father told him to do, or the one thing he told them is that if you break this covenant, you're going to have all of these curses that's going to come on you. You can read about those over in Leviticus 26, curse after curse that will come up on people, you know, when and after they broke this covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hear about that from just from the beginning of when they left Egypt until um, 
the starting with the new covenant when the Messiah, well, the New Testament when the Messiah came onto the scene, curse after curse after curse. Yeah. See, this is why a lot of people, a lot of people who are into figurines and uh, uh, false gods and, you know, um, uh, different other um, deities, they, they, they kind of reject uh, the most high God because he will punish you. Whereas the other gods, you know, they pull the figurine out of the box or they look at them on the wall or they pray to them or the, like the money God, they have the little things they, they pray to or whatever to get money. Well, if that, if that, of course he doesn't, but if that, if they believe that that God has ever gave them any money, they don't think that because they don't follow that worship that he's actually going to take that money back one day. You know, they can put that God in a box and they can forget about it until they need some money next time. But our father, he doesn't work like that. If we stop worshiping him the way he wants to be worshiped, we will get punished behind it. Is that, does that have something to do when he says something about being a jealous God? Um, it, it, that's the wording. Yeah, that's the word. But what it has to do with is, is basic what it, what it boils down to. Okay. We, before we come into the covenant, we are in a, uh, a debased state where we're kind of lowly people. We're, we're being harmed by the world. The world is taking advantage of us. They're trying to, you know, put us in the new world order and stick us with the mark of the beast and all of this stuff. They're making slaves out of us and all of this. But then when we get into the covenant and start obeying what the rules of the covenant say, then we start to become elevated. We could be started to become a higher people. We, you know, we, we start to take on some of the blessings that we get, um, like um, being exalted in the communities and stuff like that. We start to get protections from wild animals and we start to get food and we start to get um, shelter. We start to get clothing. We start to get a lot of things that are provided from our father when we're inside the covenant. Thing is, when we stop worshiping him according to the way he's described in the covenant then we start to fall off and so it starts to feel like we're cursed now mm -hmm. you know all of a sudden the wild animals are coming to you know kill our flock and those animals that we thought we were blessed with are going away because the wolves are eating them up yeah. you know our clothes are deteriorating now the the father whereas the father you know was keeping us fat and happy you know with food now you know we look at the covers and they're empty you know and it takes people a long time to realize well it, maybe it's because I stopped keeping the covenant. I'm breaking those rules of the covenant. Yeah, and you start to say things like, where did that come from? Or, or why did that happen? Why is this on me? And you yeah. are, you know, you start and you, and you don't put two and two together that right. you are now being disobedient. Right. All right, well, let's go on. 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days said the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. See, now, now we're getting into the meat of this thing, you know, because this is how we know this new covenant. This is what this new covenant is all about. This is how we know that we're actually not in this new covenant, right? One of the first things he says is I will, um, he says, I will make this uh, I will make the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. So, the, so when we're under this new covenant, this new covenant will take effect on all of humanity. It won't just be a few people. But the thing about it, the laws will be written in the mind. So you think, is the laws written on the mind of all of humanity? Does everybody have these laws that are talked about over here in, you know, Exodus chapter 20 through 24 is those laws. Does every is everybody aware of those laws? You know, people people who say that we're under a new covenant, they they a lot of them want to act like we have a new set of laws. And that the laws of old has gone away with and we don't have to worry about those laws. We can um, we don't have to worry about stuff like um, adultery or stealing or murder or uh, um, dishonoring the parents and all of those things that were covered in the old covenant. You know, they say we're under a new covenant and we have a new set of rules and we don't have to worry about those. Yeah, um, they have literally just did away 
with all the laws of the 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 old covenant. And I hate saying old, but I guess. Yeah, because we're well, you're getting that from the scripture. It, it um, Hebrews calls it the old covenant, but you know you're right when you don't want to say old because we're still under that covenant now. We're still being held accountable for those rules even today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, let's see where it says. Um, it says, I will write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me. So people. Yeah. So what we're expecting is that these laws to be written on our heart. So, you know, people want to say, okay, the Messiah brought in this, this, this new covenant. Well, if he did, what was wrong with people like Hitler? What was wrong with people like Jeffrey Dahmer? What was wrong with uh, all of these other um, historically notoriously evil people? What was on their heart? Right. Why was they different? Well, the answer is, is that this covenant has not taken effect yet. We aren't yet in the new covenant. It's still yet to come. Even today, we're looking forward to this covenant. So we're still under the covenant of the laws. Well, you're still, the laws are always going to be in effect. The right. same rules are always going to apply. You ain't never going to be able to just murder people anytime you want to. You know, you ain't never going to be able to dishonor your parents and not die behind it. You're not going to be able to steal from people and, you know, it just be okay. You know, you're just going to be a thief now. That's never, that's not coming. You're not going to be able to worship other gods. There's not coming a day when it's going to be okay to make images. You know, the, those laws in the, uh, in um, the commandments are all going to, going to always be in effect. The difference, the, and it's important to understand, the difference is those laws are not going to be written on stone tablets or even in a paperback book. Those laws are going to be written on your heart or written on your conscience. So you ain't got to refer to a book anymore. You ain't got to call up the Le Levite. You ain't got to call up the priest and say, can I do this and can I do that? You're going to know from within whether the difference between right and wrong. You're going to hear a voice coming from within you telling you the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, I guess it's just um, church talk to say and to come out of my mouth that those laws are not going to be in effect anymore because we're, we were so used to hearing that th those laws were done away with. So it's not that those laws are done away with. It's just that they're still here. They're still relevant, but they're going to be in a different. They're now spiritual they're, instead yeah. of uh, being material. Yeah, they're now they're, they're they're now a part of our conscious, and our conscious will be our guide. You know, and you know, just just to you know help understand where those guys went wrong when they said that the laws were done away with is what it boils down to is they didn't understand what the law is. Let me jump over here to the book of Malachi and show you something right quick. You see over here in the book of Malachi, which is the last book and the last chapter in the canonized Old Testament. And you see right there in Malachi chapter four and verse four, it says, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments. So this nails down the law. This is how we know that the law is exactly uh, Exodus chapter 20 through 24, verse seven. But when you go down to the church, they don't know that. When they think about, when they're talking about the law, they're talking about all 613 different commands, you know, which include dietary laws, which include sacrificial laws. And so they're, they're thinking and saying, okay, we're not supposed to be uh, sacrificing a cow on the altar. Right. So the law must be done away with. Yes. No, sacrificing a cow is not in the law. That's part of the supplemental rules that Moses talked about in the book of Leviticus and on. It's not covered. It. We're not under a contract that says that, you know, we can't eat bacon. You know what I'm saying? That's not it may not be a good idea to eat bacon, but it's not a it's not a covenant breaker to eat a sausage sandwich in the morning. Right. You know, and there's a bunch of rules, you know, in 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 the Old Testament that don't fall under the law. But because nobody has I want to say figured it out, you know, because, you know, it kind of came to me intuitively one day, you know, as I was reading the scripture that, you know, no, what we're learning in Malachi is that 
the law is a certain set of rules that was given, like we said at, at Mount Hor. And um, I don't know, people... I think sometimes they just want to make it hard so that they don't have to do it. You think that's what it is? Yeah, I believe so. Well, the thing is, once we understand what the law is, you know, we stress the law over here at Coach in the Fight, Herman's Academy, we stress the law. And I always challenge people, go in and read the book, grab an audio book if you want to, and listen to the covenant and see what in there is a rule that can't be kept. You know, what can't be done in there? And I've, I've asked, you know, several people, I've gave several people this challenge and nobody has came back yet. Out of probably 20 people, nobody has came back and listed a verse and said, uh, verse 20, chapter 21, verse so and so can't, we can't do that. Or chapter 22, verse such, such and such that can't be done anymore. We are not allowed to do that or something like that. There's no rules in the contract, no rules in the covenant that can't be kept. Mm -hmm. But while we're over here looking at Malachi, let me show you right here. Because we're going to come back to this verse right here. And, and I may not have to show it to you again because we can read it. Verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, because what we're going to learn here is that the, um, the, the, the new covenant, it's kind of tied to the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But like I said, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, 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 me, let me just go on. Let's come back over here and finish up in uh, Hebrews before we jump some other places. But, you know, so I think the point of what, what I'm trying to say here is that we're not under the new covenant. What we're actually now, we're actually still in the church age. Now, the church age started back there with Constantine in 312. When he took over the, the church and decided he was going to become the head of the Christian church and created what we know today as Catholicism, he got rid of the covenant, basically told us to um, stop obeying the Sabbath day. He told us to stop obey, obeying the statutes and instituted a bunch of pagan holidays and pagan feast days. He even went as far as to change the Ten Commandments. He took some out and added some and, and, and did some other stuff. That's the age that we live in now. That's the church age. You know, that ain't the covenant age. The covenant age doesn't start until after the church age is over. So now, I guess, to prevent um, the changing of things, because people can always change things that are written down, uh, the Father in his wisdom has put the covenant in our hearts, in our minds. Yep. He's uh, gonna... So they're not able to be changed well and plus you have to think about all that humanity is going to go through you know are we going to have a bible available for us after this covenant after the world has been you know gone through all of the fires and the floods and the hurricanes and you know the earthquakes and stuff is everybody going to have a bible available well the thing is we really won't need one because we will have the laws written on our heart even look at what 11 says right there read that 11 says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all they know me from the least to the greatest. Yeah, so even the, the we won't even have the need for a preacher man anymore because we're going to have this voice coming from our heart, coming from our conscience, there's actually going to be the father talking to us. So from the the from the greatest to the to the to the lowliest person are all going to have this same um, this same voice, the same covenant. You know, the, well, it makes me think from the illiterate to the scholar, you know, those that can't read can now have the uh, benefit of having that same voice as the professor or the scholar. Yeah. Some that never even, you know, had a chance to read the scripture at all will we'll still have the voice on. on a, but let me show you something that brought to my attention. Now, as you know, recently we've been doing a lot of classes on the Levi and the Levitical priests and their role in the era that we live in now. And, you know, the first, you know, the era, the second era that we're in now, how, you know, the father set aside these certain individuals who had the responsibility of carrying the word. And, you know, you might even read over, I hesitate to say it um, slowly, but you might remember, um, 
in the uh, uh, New Testament, it was frowned upon for women to teach. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, when you're looking over here at the Third Testament of the Bible, and we're talking about this era that we're going in now, it's saying that, you know, those, um, those, those certain people are not going to have the sole responsibility of being the bread carriers anymore. It, it says right here that the, the new apostles, you want to read it? Okay. This is coming from the third Testament chapter eight and verse 54. It says in my new apostleship, the woman shall be alongside man and there will be no age barrier in order to serve me. The same will be it for the adult as well as the child or the elder. The same for the maiden as well as the mother. Because again, I say to you that it is your spirit whom I seek and that he has left his infancy a long time ago. Yeah. So this is part of what's being talked about as far as this new covenant. This is part of the change is that everybody's going to be able to be apostles now. No, everybody's going to be able to carry the word now. It's whereas before it was frowned upon for women to preach men. Now, and this once they become spiritualized by way of the third testament, they're actually going to have a lot of the same responsibilities. Well, I'm glad that you read that because coming into this lesson, I was like, uh, am I supposed to be teaching? <laughs> am I supposed to be doing this? But when we do come into being spiritualized, um, I guess the man and the woman will be um, treated the same. Yeah, and the child. And the child. And the child. Um, even the virgin as well as the mother, because, because, I mean, it should be easy to understand is once we get into this new covenant, once this change is, is made, we're going to be spiritual beings. We're not going to be materialistic beings anymore. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to be able to speak to our father, you know, um, spirit to spirit. Right. And, you know, our spirit is much bigger than we are as humans. You know, the spirit man inside of us, we're actually going to get to know that person. That person is actually going to become dominant on our life. That's that's the that's real us. And he's actually going to present himself in a way that, you know, we know he's there. We're actually going to take, you know, kind of, you know, second fiddle when when our spirit man is awakened. You know, that's why you know I use that word rapture sometime. Exalted to a higher level of awareness when our spirit man becomes exalted and, you know, becomes his own being where we as humans are going to be almost um, servant to him. You know, we're going to be servile. We're going to be subordinate to our own spirit. Our materialistic part of us. Uh, yeah, our bodies and our flesh, because, you know, we're only used to, you know, being here for, you know, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, however long we've been here on this planet. But our spirit man has been here before and he has a lot more experiences and, and, and knows a lot more stuff. And so he's going to be like our big brother. He's going to be us. Yeah. But it, it but is 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 you know it's a different part of us that we're not really familiar with and that's part of this change that's actually going to take place in all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Our spirit man will have uh one-on-one -on -one contact with the father so he will be uh receiving directly from the father whereas our flesh part um receives directly from uh what it sees, touch, smell, um, the things of this world. Yeah. And so you'll have a little child who is able to get direct communication from the father because the father is not talking to this six year old. It's talking to this spirit being that may be thousands of years old. Yeah. Yeah. That's that has been here many, many times before. He's talking about this old man. You know, you're looking at a baby there. But, you know, this baby, you know, has a lot of experiences, may have even been a king at some point in time. You know, sometimes you hear people say about a child, he's an old soul. And that's because that child has a lot of wisdoms, you know, or a no lot of knowledge. And now when we become spiritualized, uh, that will be for every infant. They will be an old, quote, old ancient soul. Yeah, well, we learn in the, in the Third Testament that when we come here as newborn babies, we are spiritual beings. You know, people, you know, often ask what happens to babies in the tribulation or whatever. Well, it's only after we start to embrace sin do we create a separation between us and 
the spirit world, us and the father. We, we create a block between um, 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 us and our conscious, so to speak. That's where our father lives is in our conscious. But the more we take on sin, the more we we um, create a block or a separation between the conscious. That's what it means when it says that um, the um, conscious it, when it says that the law is our schoolmaster. Mm-hmm. Yep, because it actually keeping the law, obeying the law takes us to a higher level of cleanliness to where we can start to hear the conscience and we can start to hear the spirit world again. Well, before that child takes on sin and becomes angry and becomes selfish and become, you know, idolatrous or whatever, he is in direct communication with the spirit world. That's why when you look at, you know, some of the other religions um, that teach about uh, reincarnation, they'll have children that will be remembering past lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two and three years old who remember their past lives. But you had talked to them kids, you know, at the age of 12 and 15 and they have no idea what you're talking about. You know, I I was remembering and saying what? Well, it's because by then they've taken on sin and they've created a separation, a block between them and the spirit world. And the only way they're going to get it back now is through um, through this covenant that the Messiah is the mediator in. Mm-hmm. And that that what we have to understand that the Messiah's role. I'm trying to cover you know everything in this video, but that is the, the Messiah's role in all of this. Through baptism, he actually cleans away that sin that is a block on us. So take, for instance, yourself, you know, speaking hypothetically, of course, when you were born, you were clean. You are a clean spirit. You had no faults, no flaws on on your human being. You was able to be in spirit to spirit communication, you know, until you was about three, four years old when you started to take on sin. Because your parents were into sin, they were into idolatry, so you was into idolatry. You saw them being mean and hateful, and so you decided you wanted to be mean and hateful. Right. And the more you took on sin, the more you created a block and put stains on your spirit. The more you broke the covenant, the more you put stains on your spirit. Well, through baptism, that first baptism that you go through actually cleans away all of those sins. All of those sins are forgiven in that moment. And so it is at that moment that you can actually become a spiritualized individual and you could actually take advantage of the conscious. You could actually, you know, get in spirit to spirit communication. You could actually take advantage of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a little bit of effort in the day that we live in now. We have to spend a lot of time meditating and a lot of time praying. And I was hoping to pull those verses out. We um, have to spend a lot of time um, in quietness to hear our conscience in the day that we live in now. But um, once we have been baptized and clean, cleansed away those sins, then we can't get in that spirit to spirit communication. The problem is that nobody ever told us that. And so right after we got baptized, the first thing we did was went back and got dirty again. Mm-hmm. Nobody told us that our baptism was actually cleansing away our sins. And that was the purpose of us getting baptized. And so the first thing we did was, you know, we went out. I know I did. Yeah. I went right, right back to doing the same things that I was doing, whether it was adultery, whether it was idolatry, whether it was stealing, whatever it was that I was doing before I got baptized, not knowing that I was in a clean state and I should have been, you know, trying to preserve that cleanliness, you know, I I went and got dirty again. Yeah, we were never told, well, I was never told what baptism really meant. I was just told it was just something that we were supposed to do. Uh, So we were never explained uh, exactly why and what we needed to do to continue to keep that cleanliness upon ourselves. And so we we kind of fell off and put ourselves back in a position where we can't hear our conscience anymore because the laws are there. The law, if, if, if we can ever get to a quiet state and actually hear our conscience, it's really mm-hmm. tough. You know, I've tried it, you know, and it's really tough to hear our conscience in, in the state that we live in now. But if we can ever, you know, get to that elevated state in a quiet position, we can actually hear that soft, still voice speaking to us from the inside. You know, of course, that's going to change here in the future. That voice is going to get really loud. But, you know, again, that's the purpose. That's 
people always ask, well, what what did Jesus do? What, what, what did he mediate? Well, he made it so that we can reach a certain level of cleanliness to where we can take advantage of this this uh, this new covenant. And back over here at Hebrews, that's a, looking at verse 11 of chapter 8. This is another way that we know that we're not quite there yet. You see where it says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor. So like we've said, you know, there's coming a time when everybody is going to know the father for themselves. And when you look around us today, you know, why do we still have preachers? Why do we still have teachers? Why is there still, why is coaching the fight still putting up videos if we're in this new covenant when nobody needs to be taught anything anymore? Yeah. Yeah, we're not. We're we're not there yet. Okay. Well, let me let me um take everyone to um chapter 34 again and verse 17. And I'm going to pull it out where it says chapter 34 of the third testament. Chapter 34 of the third testament and verse 17. And I'm going to flip over to it real quick talking about What page um, is that? That is page 310. And you guys, you can look in the description of this video and find a link to this third testament of the Bible if you haven't done so already. Um, there's both an audio version and a PDF that you could download. You're actually looking at the PDF version um, that we've downloaded. And I would consider printing it because it's hard to find a uh, paperback copy of this book. Mm -hmm. All right. What verse are you looking at? This is verse 17. Of chapter 34. Of chapter 34, page 310. And it goes along with um, Hebrews chapter 8 and 11, is, which says again, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. And in chapter 30, 34, verse 17, it says, The conscience has always manifested itself in man, but man has not achieved the necessary elevation, evolution to guide all his life by the, the divine voice. Man has needed laws, teaching, precepts, religions, and advice for guidance. So what it's saying is that the conscience has always, which we're saying is the new covenant. Mm -hmm. It has always been there with us. Yeah. But we had not yet been able, we had not yet uh, developed enough. We had not yet uh, reached the necessary development to hear the voice of the conscious. That is why we needed the covenant. That is why we needed those laws, those precepts. That is why we needed man to teach us and guide us because we had not yet reached that development. But there is going to come a time where those things are no longer needed. Going back to 11, it says... They shall not teach every man his neighbor. We're no longer going to need a man, a set of written down rules to teach us. We're going to have it already within our mind, within our hearts. Yeah. I mean, we, we had to have a lot of guidance. You know, not only did we have to have the law and somebody standing behind a pulpit telling us the difference between right and wrong, but we had to have police officers. Mm -hmm. We had to have judges. You know what I mean? When, when, the, when the preacher man couldn't convince us. That that thing that we were doing was wrong. Well, now you got this cop that's going to put some handcuffs on us and he's going to take us down to the judge and the judge will convince us that we're doing wrong. Right. You know, we had to have plenty of guidance in this thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you said, that that day is about to change. Yeah. It's uh, going on to 18. It says when men come to enter into the communion with their spirit and instead of looking for it outwardly, we will seek it inside of us and there will be it says a persuasive gentle wise just voice that will lead us um into basically leading us into what the father is saying let me read verse 18 okay. it says when men come to enter into communion with their spirits and instead of looking for it outwardly seek it within themselves they can hear that gentle persuasive wise and just voice that has always been vibrating within them without being heard and they come to understand that the conscious is the presence of god and that it is the true means 
by which men should communicate with their father cre and creator. Wow, that's a mouthful there. Yep. Mm -hmm. We need to look at some of this stuff and is like you said, um that we're no longer going to look outwardly. Mm -hmm. We're not going to look at people, books or or anything that we can see. We're going to look inwardly. Inwardly, yeah. And then it describes it here. They can hear that gentle, persuasive, wise, and just voice. We've we've always heard that. You know, it's call it a small, still voice or something like that. We we've always known that that voice was in us. But nobody bothered to, you know, explain to us that that, first of all, was our conscious. Yeah. Secondly, is actually the voice of God talking from within us. That's, our, that's you know, that's him speaking to us directly, you know. And, and you know, what does it say? It's, it's uh, gentle, it's persuasive, wise, and just voice that has always been vibrating within them without being heard. And see, this is where we're at now. Mm -hmm. You know, this voice is in there. But, you know, we can shut it down. Oh, yeah, we can shut it down. We can we we can ignore it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm and I'm looking at some of the comments and stuff that I'm getting on the channel. You know, sometimes people call me names and say stuff and I want to just let them have it sometimes, you know. And, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll succumb to, you know, that evil spirit and I'll start typing up a, a real doozy of a comment. <laughs> yeah. But the more I get along in that comment. The more I hear this this gentle voice, this wise voice saying, "Do not push that sin button. Right. Do not do not do it." And sometimes I'll 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 I'll, I'll get an agreement, but I'll go ahead and I'll type it out anyway, and I'll proofread it and everything before I delete the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We all do that. We all do that. Well, not all of us. Sometimes we just flat out ignore it. And yeah. push the send button before we ever let that voice, you know, have its way with us. Before we ever get persuaded by that voice, we hurry up and push that send button. Push it quick. Yeah, we're ignoring the voice. What you're doing is you're ignoring the voice of the Father. You actually because are, yeah. The Third Testament tells us that when we are born, the Father gives us uh one of many, but he gives us free will and he also gives us the gift of the conscious and so it's there and it's been there all this time like we said we just haven't been we haven't been developed enough to hear it but it's amazing and you just said how they never taught us that that was the voice of god yeah and we have been going through life saying you know something's telling me that i shouldn't be doing that yeah and that was the voice of the father telling us and we just, we blew it off as something told me that yeah. or, or whatever. And that's just, that's, that's amazing that we have had his voice Teaching with us, us and guiding yeah, us, guiding us this entire time. And we just ignored it. But there's a time, as you said, that the, this voice is going to be so strong that we're not going to be able to ignore it. But that brings me to another point that I wanted to make is... We, you know, sometimes the scripture talks about uh, denying the Christ mm -hmm. and it talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, that is what we have to look forward to after we go through this change, after humanity is changed in this way and our conscience becomes dominant to where we can actually hear it forcefully directing us, telling us not to do this, telling us not to do that. We're actually going to hear this almost in an audible tone. You know, it's going to be dominant. It's going to be, you know, something, something. Let me, in fact, let me jump over here and show you this verse coming out of uh, chapter 55, verse 39. Let me push the pause. Uh, verse 29. Um, go ahead and read that verse, Dave. Okay, so this is coming out of the Third Testament, chapter 55, verse 29, and it's on page 457. It says, but the hour of the conscious approaches. It is the same as if you would say that the day of the Lord or his judgment is about to take place. Then shame will rise in some and remorse in others. Now, we know we could spend all day on this verse right here. This is what's talked about over there in the book of Daniel and chapter 12, starting with what I think at verse one. Um, it's what we looked at over there in Malachi chapter four and verse five, I think it was. Um I think we're going to jump over there and look at it in um, Revelations in chapter 8. But you see here, it's talking about the hour of the conscious. 
This is what we've been talking about all day. When we're talking about this change that humanity is about to go through, where we're going to be able to hear our consciences again. But look how it's talking right here. It says, and it is the same as if you would say that the day of the Lord or his judgment is about to take place. This, this right here is going to be a huge deal. It's actually, let matter of fact, let me go over and show you in the book of Revelations, because it actually appears that the, the, um, the hour of the conscious, this new covenant that we're talking about here, the great awakening, as we refer to it, actually starts the tribulation. When you're looking at here, like you're looking at chapters, we're looking at the book of Revelation. You look at chapter seven, it's talking about the ceiling of the 144,000. Then when you look at chapter eight, it's talking about um, the how the set the, the angels with the seven trumpets are about to blow. You see there in verse two, you know, they have their trumpets, but they're not blowing. And then when you see right there in verse three, verse four, verse five, there seems to be this altar or this, um, this ceremony, this holy convocation is going on here as if, you know, our, our cre our Messiah is taking his, uh, responsibilities as the high priest and he's doing some type of atonement day ceremony here. And then you see down there that, you know, then the angels start to blow. So it's like, when you read this and you read in other places, it seems as though this hour of the conscious, which, you know, we see the connection between the day of the Lord is actually going to start the tribulation. This new covenant. This new covenant is going to start the tribulation. And see, from what all I've gathered out of this, and I'm going to have to start speculating a little bit here, but from what I've gathered... I guess that might have been my alert not to speculate, but I'm going to ignore the conscience here. <laughs> but from what I gather, it's, it's, it's like, okay, so humanity goes through this change. We can hear this voice coming from within us now. Everybody, you know, hears it to some levels. To some people, it'll be small. Some people, it'll be greater. Some people will be, you know. But the thing is, it'll be in there, and it'll be, and it'll be trying to tell us the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. But... The municipalities and the governments are going to be, for some reason, the new world order who will be highly threatened by this new king that's trying to take over. Right. They want to maintain their own sovereignty and they don't want anybody coming and intruding on that. However, it is our father's plan that he's going to be our king one day. Mm -hmm. And here we have his voice who we can all now hear. You have these new, you have the new world order guys who are trying to hold on to their power, trying to make people deny and say that they don't hear that voice anymore. So that's what you hear about in the scripture when it says, if you sh if you deny Christ, he will deny you. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we don't have any of that going on now. There's nobody out here that, you know, are in a position where they are forced to deny him, you know. It, it, you know, somebody, they think, you know, they put you in a, in a, in a firing line and, you know, say, are you a Christian or whatever? But, you know, by the definition of the word, you know, anybody can weasel out of that. Yes. But once mm -hmm. the, once the out, but once this conscious becomes dominant and you're hearing that voice, it's not going to be deniable. It's not going to, you're going to, you're not going to be able to deny it, mm -hmm. but there are going to be some that do. Because they want to be part of the new world order or because they feel threatened or for one reason or another, they're going to stand up and they're going to say, no, I don't hear nothing. Or no, I, 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 that was just some voices I heard in my head, but they're gone now. Or no, I don't know what you're talking about. Or that was some aliens that was talking to me. Or no, that was Project Blue Beam. Or that was this new 5G te technology that's, that's you know coming across and it's actually messing with me. It, it ain't God that I hear there. It's not the Father that I hear there. It's this 5G technology. And so then they're going to deny the Holy Spirit in them. And of course, they're going to be the ones that's left out in the cold when it's time for protections. Yeah, denying or not refusing to acknowledge that that is the voice of the father speaking to them yeah a lot of a lot of fear and then that's also where you're gonna get the blasphemy from too because you got people that who will um i ain't gonna talk about that too much <laughs> okay this is my second time getting the uh 
getting a uh, kind of a warning not to talk about that. But I believe that the blasphemy, it should be easy to understand how blasphemy can come out of that too when you have this spirit that's trying to tell you what to do mm-hmm. and you don't really want it telling you what to do. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's just going to be more so prevalent because even, you know, today we can ignore it or today we can decide that we're not going to listen to it. So it's just going to be stronger then. And um, just like today, we have the opportunity to deny it if we choose to. Yeah. And so just wanted to bring those two points out, but I'm going I'm to I'm not finish them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to listen to the conscious. One of the things that I want to bring out while you're looking for um, further scriptures is in our talking about how the the conscious is the new covenant. And like I said, you know, again, I use that word loosely, new and old. Um, whereas the old covenant was written down on paper, the new covenant um, is written down within our heart and some of the notes that I had written down I said um the conscious which is the inner guide that the father has given to us who comes along and assists our spirit man to do what the word of God to do what the word of the father wants us to do he speaks to us and tells us exactly what the father is saying because he the guide is the father and that is spiritually. But the old covenant is a material um, guide. The new covenant, which is the conscious, is a spiritual guide mm-hmm. that tells us exactly what the Father wants us to do. Mm-hmm. The law, we'll say, was the material guide that told us exactly what the father wants us to do so you can see how it's the same thing but it's just taking on different forms yeah yeah it's it's, it's the, the, the both of them are going to guide us to the same place yeah what mm-hmm. what that what that reminds me of and you know i'd have to do a search for it matter of fact let me do a search for it okay over here in ecclesiastes chapter three where it says to everything there is a season hmm. and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So to in today's time we're told not to kill. But we find out in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there's a time to kill. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a time for everything, even a time to steal. There's a time to steal. Mm-hmm. And so we have this law written on paper or written on tablets that's to be our schoolmaster that says don't steal okay so we live by this you know you're looking at this thing you might be hungry your kids might be hungry but you have this law written on paper in this book that says you can't steal that you can't steal that thing that's wrong and so you don't do it right Mm -hmm. but then this change that we're going to go through when the laws are written on our heart okay and now, you know, here it is, you know, so many years down the line, we'll say 50 years down the line. And you're sitting here with your child who's hungry and he don't have any food. OK, and here's this guy in this Walmart truck that's taking food and putting it in a dumpster. OK, mm-hmm. the dumpster has a lock on it. Mm-hmm. The dumpster, the food in it don't belong to you. Mm-hmm. He's throwing it away. He don't want it. Mm-hmm. You actually going to get that is still in. Yeah. Right? Because it has a big sign on it that says this dump this dump dumpster belongs to Walmart. Yeah. yeah. And so now you're technically stealing. Right. But you have the con you have you under the conscious now, and your conscious is able to see past the right. written word of the law and say, No, nah, huh, we going over here and get this. Right. It's not telling you not to do away with the law, but it's like you're saying, it's seeing past that written. Seeing bridge. past yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, it, it says it's a time to kill. It may be a time when you might have to bust a cap in somebody. Right. You know, or what else does it say here? Uh, time to heal or time to break down. You know, it's a time for everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so when we're when we are under the conscious, our conscious will be our guide and it will 
it will lead us. You know, like, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll be on a Sabbath day and there may be, you know, a bug or something on us, you know, and we're afraid that we're going to bite, that bug is going to bite us or right. get on our food. And we're like, um, well, according to the law, we can't kill that bug. We're not right. supposed to smite him on a Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Well, when we're under the conscious, you know, our conscious may tell us different. Right. You know, go ahead and kill that roach or whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean? mean? It's a yeah, time. mosquito, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. don't I sit mean, there and let the mosquito bite you. Yeah, he's going to be there to um, to direct and guide us and to basically just to teach us. Teach I mean, him. yeah, to teach us. But we can't we can't act like we're there yet, though. A lot of people want to act like we're already there. But can, can certain individuals be there? No, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't be there because... I mean, well, I guess, I guess in certain cases you can, but we're taking it too far. If you give people leeway, they're going to say, well, my conscience allows me to eat food sacrificed under idols. Mm -hmm. My food, my, my conscience allows me to, you know, commit adultery. You know, my wife ain't acting right or my husband ain't acting right. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's a time for everything. It yeah, must be I a can, time. Yeah. I can see past what you're yeah, seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so people take, uh, -uh we, 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 there's going to be a hard and fast. Uh, event. event that's going to take place and i was going to show you guys that over here in first thessalonians um chapter five we've already made the connection between um the conscious and the day of the lord but then when you come over here and you look at first thessalonians chapter five and you see when it is that we're expecting the day of the lord in verse two it says for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So this is what we're actually waiting for here. You know, people always like to talk about timing and dates and stuff. This is what we're waiting for before we make this transition. These people, I don't know who exactly is going to be, but they're going to cry peace and safety. And then we're going to be in the day of the Lord. And like we read over there in Malachi before that great and dreadful day. You, uh, the Elijah spirit is going to be right there to help us to understand the law and understand to make the that covenant. Transition. To make yeah. yeah, you read about that over there in Malachi chapter four. And jump back over there and look at that right quick. It says, "Behold, I send you Elijah." The prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is how we're going to hear his. This, this is who's going to be helping us from within. This Elijah spirit. Notice the name Elijah or El I Yah or the Spirit of the Lord is the name. That's what Elijah means, the Spirit of the Lord. Mm -hmm. No, but my point is, is that we're pretty much almost there. We're just waiting for them to cry peace and safety and we, we will be there. Yeah. All right. Well, one of the last things I'll remind you guys is that we are actually in the 10 days of awe. And so this is important now as we are awaiting these times when we are to come under this new covenant because we are given some chances to get right. You know, one of the things you hear about in the Third Testament and other places is that it's going to be according to our level of preparation that we'll be able to hear his voice, that 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 guide voice that's coming from within us. Mm -hmm. And now that we're in the 10 days of awe that started in 2017, will last until uh, the year 2027 in 2017 with the Revelations 12 sign in the sky that was the trumpet blowing period. We've done plenty of classes on that, but we are given more time. In order to get right with the Father, like we read about in Daniel chapter 9, we are still in this covenant building period where he says he will build a covenant uh, with many for one week. So we're, my point is that we're given chances to to um, to you let that let that law be our schoolmaster so that when this change actually takes place, it won't catch us by surprise. Yeah, right here. And I'm just glad I just glanced down here at it. Um, and this is chapter 55 and it is verse 20. It says, I have always given you time to prepare and apportion the means for your salvation before sending my justice to receive an accounting from you at the end of an era. So he is giving us time. He's yeah. giving us time to prepare 
and um, to get ready. Yeah, we are in the 10 days of all. We are in this time. I was listening to the class we did and you guys could check out that class where, you know, my wife and I first, you know, talked about the connection between the new covenant and the hour of the conscience or the conscience being the new covenant. And you mentioned in that it was right before atonement day. And it was like a few days before atonement day when you said that you found yourself in a repentant state. Yes. Thinking about something in relationship to your father. See, we didn't know about the 10 days of all then, mm -hmm. but that's actually what you were experiencing. Yeah, I remember that. And I don't know. I didn't at the time know where it was coming from. I just remember being very sorrowful uh, for something, uh, comments that I have had made to my dad before he passed and just being very sorrowful for it and just immediately going into a state of repenting. And, and, and that happened during the 10 days of awe in 2019. And we did not know about it. Hey, that's hey, the spirit works. The spirit we're going to work. You know, for those who love the Lord, everything works for good for those who love the Lord, whether you know or not. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and the thing is, not only are we in 10, 24 hour periods that started with Rosh Hashanah in 2020, but we are in 10, 364 day periods that started back there in 2017 as well. So we all need to be working on our repentant, becoming repentant um during this period uh, we need to be trying to get right because you know atonement day is coming yeah repenting and, uh husband wives moms sons all of us you know need to be at a state of uh restitution yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I would advise you to, you know, check out the book called The Shepherd of Hermes, you know, that was once considered canonical, you know, way back before, you know, the Catholic Church were threatened by that book and realized that, you know, it was teaching people too much about, you know, how it is that we can, you know, get in this tower like temple. I would advise you guys to read that book and understand repentance. Um because it, it teaches the most about repentance out of any book, scriptural document that I've ever read. So mm -hmm. um, you can find a link to it in the description of this video, along with the uh, third testament that we've been talking about here. But with that, I believe we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Any other closing comments on the new covenant? Um, I don't have any closing comments. i uh, just very grateful that we made a connection what i believe i think we did make made a connection from the um old covenant of the law material to the new covenant of the conscious spiritual it just i mean if you think about it read about it it just makes sense and uh it's something that for us to look forward to and start preparing yeah start preparing and not be surprised because you know they're gonna act crazy they're gonna say that it's it's 5g they're going to say that it's uh, Project Blue Beam. They're going to say that it's a uh, harp. They're going to say that it's aliens talking. They're going to say that people are going crazy. Yeah, that's they, they're going to come up with all kinds of ideas to, to explain away, you know, to make people think, to make to take people's focus off of the fact that, no, this is, this is our father talking to us from within. This is the new covenant. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is the new covenant. All right, y'all, if you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit the dislike button, but leave a comment either way. Shalom. Shalom.